So I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Can you all see the, yes. uh, the slides? Yep. Okay. So I want to welcome all of you to uh, my first webinar of 2021. So this is to sell or not to sell. So you're all in the right place if you're here for that. <laughs> um, so I just want to ask uh, all of you to, you know, put anything that's distracting away, you know, maybe cell phone or something like that. Um, please put yourself on mute for now. And at the end, we're going to have lots of time for Q&A and for any kind of um, comments, questions that you have. So while I'm going along, if you have some questions, maybe just jot it down and I'll be really happy to answer them at the end for you. Um, so you can get them all answered. So um, before we start, I just want to know how many of you uh, have jewelry that um, you just don't wear anymore. Maybe uh, it's just been hidden in the drawer or in a safety deposit box, or maybe you've been cleaning your house out and finding jewelry that you didn't even remember that you had, right? <coughs> so how many of you um, have had this yeah, a few of you, right? <laughs> and how many of you were thinking about maybe selling it because you didn't know what else to do with it? Anyone thought of selling it? Yeah. So I get a lot of that. So that's why I wanted this to be um, my first jewelry webinar this year of whether to sell or not to sell your jewelry. And what you are going to learn today and what I'm going to reveal are the trade secrets, why it's a mistake to sell your jewelry, uh, how much you're really getting, and is it really worth selling, and ways to maximize your jewelry investment, because that's really what you want to do. You want to get the most bang for your buck, right? Everybody does. <laughs> So I am a gemologist and an appraiser, and I work for some retail stores as an appraiser and to help them um, buy jewelry from customers that come in with uh, pieces they inherited or maybe pieces that they found around the house, and they're wondering uh, what the value is and how much money that they can get if they were to sell it. And a lot of times, I go through um, their jewelry and, you know, it comes out to be a lower price than they thought. And, then, you know, they're completely shocked by this because they say, well, I paid so much more retail. Why is it so, so much less? You know, and then I have to explain it to them. Um, and this is really the reason why I wanted to do this. Um, so you can avoid it, the number one mistake of selling your jewelry. So the number one mistake you can make is for you, the consumer, to sell your jewelry back to a retailer. And this is why I want you to be completely informed of these trade secrets. And you may be asking yourself, you may be asking yourself why, because um, I can get a lot of money, right? Well, you can get some money from selling your jewelry, of course, but to make back the money that you bought when you um, purchased it uh, retail or make money more money than from what you purchased it, you can't make that money back. So you do get some, but you will, won't make money from it. So this is why I wanna share with you the seven secrets of selling your jewelry so that you can avoid this number one mistake. And before we get started, I just want to tell you a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Jennifer Vyshinsky, and I'm a graduate jeweler gemologist. Um, I am certified by Gemological Institute of America. So I'm a gemologist, a jeweler, a designer, appraiser. I worked as a GIA instructor teaching diamonds, color stones, pearls, appraisals. Um, I also worked for a diamond lab 
for a number of years grading and certifying diamonds um, so that you can know exactly what you're getting. I worked for master gemologist appraisers um, where we did all different kinds of appraisals. Um, also, now I'm an appraiser and buyer for retail stores, as well as I own my own business called Rejuvenated Designs, where I give old jewelry a fresh new life. So let's dive into it and learn the trade secrets. So the number one secret is that the retailer can buy wholesale. So when they're buying from you, they want to make the most money that they can because they can already buy jewelry wholesale. And so they don't really need your old jewelry to buy. And nowadays they can actually um, borrow pieces on memo, which means that they don't have to pay for this piece of jewelry until it's sold. So when you come along with your jewelry, you usually get about a quarter to a third of the retail price. So say the retail price was $1,000. So maybe you'll get about, you know, $200, $250 for that piece, depending on what it is. And you're going to learn about some of those other things a little bit later on. But, you know, if you're coming with your older pieces, it's going to be tough for them to sell and they can buy new jewelry wholesale or get it on memo, like I said. So secret number two is retailers are only interested in jewelry that their store can resell. So if you come in with, uh, you know, grandma's old ring that's broken or it's out of date or, you know, it's used and it's basically something that you don't want anymore, how do you figure that the retailer can resell it? So they want something trendy, something that they can make money from, something that they can resell. And say you have a style, maybe you bought it from Zales or something like that, and you bring it to you know London Jewelers. London Jewelers. That's not the same quality, that's not the same style, that's not the same branding. So it's not something that they can resell. So they will, probably buy it for just scrap gold. They won't buy it as a whole piece of jewelry. So you have to think about that if, if you actually do want to sell it to a retailer, the kind of piece that you do have, if it fits into their jewelry store, if they do have an estate section and they can um, make money from reselling this piece and it fits into their brand. The third secret is the truth about colored stones. So I have seen so many times people come in with a, a ring with a big red stone or a big, you know, bluish purple stone. And they said, this is my grandmother's. It's, you know, a perfect ruby or if it's a perfect this. And usually it's a synthetic ruby or a synthetic color change sapphire or something like that. Because in the beginning of the 1900s, synthetics was a big thing. Um, in the 50s, large stones like citrine and smoky quartz were very big. So the reality when you go to sell these pieces is that <clears throat> it's just for the scrap metal. So what happens is that they'll put this ring, necklace, whatever on the scale and you actually get a deduction for the colored stone. So say it has a big citrine and you put it on the scale and it weighs 10 penny weights or 10 grams, however they, uh, however they measure their weight. I usually do penny weights. So if I figure that, you know, that citrine weighs about three penny weights, I'll actually deduct that from the whole weight of it. So you're actually only getting money for seven penny weights. You don't get anything for the stone and it's actually deducted from the price that you get um, mm -hmm. because usually the colored stones are heavier and you take off that kind of weight from the whole piece. So secret number four is that 
you pay big money for a designer, but you don't get that money back. So this is the truth about designer jewelry. So if it's something trendy like Tiffany, Van Cleef and Arpels, Cartier, um, you can get a little bit more, you know, especially if it's a kind of store that uh, has people looking for these types of brands or a higher end. Um, so you can get a little bit more, especially if it has some sort of certification with it that um, says it's Tiffany or says it's Van Cleef and Arpels. But any other designer, um, especially if that store doesn't carry that kind of designer, will just be for scrap metal, uh, maybe a little bit over if it's saleable um, and they can resell it, but uh, you don't get anywhere close to what you paid for a designer piece. And, um, and usually when you purchase from a designer line, it's about three to six times more than cost. So you figure that you're only getting about a quarter to a third of the retail price. Um, you know, you're losing a lot of money and um, you don't get that money back anywhere close to it. So secret number five is the truth about selling your precious metal. So right now, mm -hmm. Right now, uh, we're living in uncertain times and the metal prices are very unstable. I don't know if you guys, you know, watch this kind of thing, but since I see it every day, it goes up a lot, it goes down, it goes up, it goes down. So in order to uh, make the most money from this, you know, they deduct about 25 to 30% off of the spot price of that particular day. So because they don't go to the refiner every day, that's how they get their money back is they bring this gold or platinum to a refiner and then they get money for this precious metal. Um, so since it's uncertain times, they want to make sure that they're getting close to the price that they paid for it from you and make money and make sure they're making money. When it's stable, they can maybe deduct about 15 to 20% um from the spot price and usually things are okay that they're not losing any money but now that it's uncertain times they take a little bit more off because they don't know if it's going to dip down uh suddenly or not secret number six is the truth about selling your diamonds so uh, usually this is where a jewelry store can make a lot of money, especially if it's a center stone, because center stone meeting uh, sell it for an engagement ring. So an engagement ring diamond maybe starts at a half a carat. So there's a hundred points to one carat. So a half a carat would be 50 points. So 50 points and above uh, is considered a center stone. So um, usually you want, we want something certified. So this way, if it's certified by uh, an independent laboratory, it will give you the exact weight. It will give you the exact color and clarity of this gemstone um, so, that, so that the jeweler doesn't have to guess. And the deduction depends on mostly the shape of it. Then if it's a good cut, because right now, uh, people want excellent, excellent, excellent cut or very good. So very close to um, excellent or very good. They want a nice color. They want a nice clarity. You know, so think of something that you would buy. You want something that's a nicer quality. So right now people are looking for quality over size. So um, if it's a round stone and it has this nice quality, it would probably be 20 to 25% uh, less than the lowest wholesale price that a jeweler can find. So they'll look on the wholesale pricing list, deduct 20 to 25% and multiply that by however much your diamond weighs. So that's for rounds. This is also true for ovals right now because ovals are very popular. They're high in demand. 
um, and people, you know, people really want them. So this will be in that 20 to 25 percent less than wholesale as well. For yes. Martha, can you mute? For Princess, Emerald, or Cushion, um, these are somewhat popular, not as popular as they used to be, but they're not unpopular. So these will probably be 30 to 35 percent uh, less than the lowest wholesale price. Um, if you have a pair or marquee that was very popular in the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, then um, I'm sorry to say that this gets the largest deduction and it's about 65 to 75 percent off of the lowest wholesale price. So really you're not getting much money for um, a marquee or a pair because they're just not popular and it's harder for a retail store to sell. Also, if you look at this ring on the slide, it has all of those little marquee diamonds. So you won't get anything for those diamonds because again, they won't be able to sell that, uh, use those little marquees. If you have something with all sorts of small little round diamonds, again, you don't get any extra money for them. Um, if it's about 25 points or higher, you know, 25 to, to the 50 mark, maybe you get 50% off of the wholesale price per carat. But if it's small, like these marquees or small, like small little rounds, you don't get anything back, but you don't get any kind of deduction either, like you do with the colored stones. So then the last secret, secret number seven, is the truth about selling uncertified center diamonds. So uncertified center diamonds are usually in a mounting, right? So <clears throat> what the jeweler has to do is measure the stone in the mounting. So sometimes you can't get the depth because you have that mounting covering it up. So they have to estimate the uh, carat weight of the stone. And um, what happens is if it maybe around a 95 points or maybe about a carat, so you estimate on the lower side because once you hit that carat mark uh, or some other uh, magic number, then the price per carat will jump up. So, so if they're not sure if it's 95 points or a carat, they'll probably tend towards the, um, the lighter side. So it's less per carat. Also with the color, if it's, <laughs> I know, if it's in a mounting, uh, especially if it's in a yellow gold mounting, it's very difficult to find uh, the exact color. So usually it's given a color range. And a lot of the, the jewelry, especially that I get, are so dirty, nobody cleans their jewelry. And you know, you try and clean it so you can see that color a little bit better. And you know, sometimes as much as you try and clean it, it's it's hard to get it fully cleaned during the time that you're you're helping them. So you get put a color range to it. So say it's G to H. And then with clarity, you have prongs. So sometimes underneath the prongs, there can be a chip or there can be, you know, an inclusion that you may not see. So you give that a range also. So say it's SI1 to SI2. So when we look for the value, you'll go, we will go on the lower side and look at something comparable that's HSI2 instead of GSI, instead of the higher GSI1. So that's why it's um, better to have something that has a certificate. This way it says exactly the, the size of it, the carat weight, the color, and the clarity. This way somebody can't say it's something different. Um, also with center stones, if it's something that is saleable and nice and it doesn't have a certificate, some jewelers actually might uh, deduct what it may cost them to get a certification. So to send it to GIA to get certified so they can sell it easier. And this costs about like $100, $150, depending on how big that uh, stone is. 
so just to recap, um, so you get less, you get no money or less money for some des most designer pieces. Um, if it's handmade, the jeweler could care less if it's handmade or not. They just care if it's gold, platinum, you know, diamonds. That's all they care about. You pay more for handmade when you buy it originally, but you won't get that money back. Colored stones, we said, gets deducted. And small diamonds um, doesn't add or subtract. It's just kind of with the, the gold or platinum weight. So you don't get less or more, more money for that. Unless, um, like I said, it's 25 points or a little bit higher. Okay, so how can we get the most bang for your jewelry? Maximize your investment of your jewelry. So if you're not a jewelry person, you don't like to wear jewelry, but you get them as gifts, um, or you had it when you were a kid and you just don't wear it anymore, um, and you want or need the money, then selling it privately, like to a family member or a friend or a neighbor, uh, somebody like that, uh, you'll get a little bit more money. Uh, if you sell it on eBay, or if it's a little bit uh, more of a special piece, you can, sm you can sell it at a small auction, like Heritage. If it's fancier, then you can do Sotheby's. Um, Sotheby's will give you a better price. And this will give you the most money back because you're selling it at um, a fair market value, which is what somebody is willing to pay for this piece of jewelry because they like it and they cherish it. Instead of going to a jewelry store and you have to wait for somebody to come and buy this um, particular piece, um, piece of jewelry. Another way is, again, if you're not a jewelry person and you don't want or need the money, so you don't like to wear jewelry, but you really don't need the money, then you can gift it to someone who would love it and wear it. Because say you have a gold chain or a gold bracelet or something like that. To buy that gold chain or gold bracelet right now at retail, gold is over 1900 an ounce. So you will be paying a very high retail price. And when you sell it, you only get that, um, the weight of that particular chain. And chains are usually very light, unless it's some, you know, big, thick, solid, you know, piece. Uh, then of course you get a little bit more. But again, to buy it retail, you'll be paying three, four, five times more than you're actually going to get. So the number one way of getting the most bang for your buck, uh, and this is if you are a jewelry person and you love to wear jewelry, is to repurpose your old, broken, inherited, unworn, out-of-date jewelry. Um, or if you have a breakup or a divorce or something, uh, and it really has no value to to you or a jeweler, you can transform it into something completely new, completely different, and completely unique, um, and something that you will love to wear. And I do have some examples for you. Um, most of you have seen me wear this ring <laughs> that is in the slide. So this was actually a broken uh, tennis bracelet that I got from my grandmother. I inherited it from my grandmother. She didn't give it to me broken. <laughs> it just happened to be. And I'm really not a bracelet person. I wear my Fitbit watch. So I'm more of a ring person. So I decided to transform this bracelet into a double eternity band. And this way I can use the diamonds that you wouldn't get much money from anyway and turn it into a beautiful new ring. So not only that I love to wear, but it also carries those memories from my grandmother. And this particular ring, I get so many compliments from and getting these compliments, I get to tell the story of my grandmother and that it was her bracelet. And I get to tell that story of the transformation and relive those memories of her and have her, you know, with me all the time. And it's really very heartwarming for me. 
and it could be for you too. <laughs> um, this particular piece was an eternity band that a client of mine had. Um, it was her 20th anniversary. So um, this wedding band not only didn't fit her finger anymore, but it didn't fit her style anymore. After 20 years, she kind of wanted a change. She wanted a little bit more bling. Um, so she wanted a wraparound ring and she wanted to update it to be more of a showpiece, more of a centerpiece. So we made this wraparound ring with her princess cut diamonds um, and added some rounds. And she absolutely loved it and kind of reignited that love for her wedding band and for her engagement ring. And um, 20 years of marriage, <laughs> put that love and that spark back into that marriage. So on the other, opposite end, uh, if you're divorced or have an old wedding ring, these are three pieces that I actually made from wedding bands. So the uh, one with the purple stones with the amethysts, those were actually a pair of earrings and the wedding band was a Tiffany wedding band. And like I said, even though it's designer and you may have paid a lot of money, that Tiffany wedding band, you just throw on the scale and you get, you know, maybe $40, $40 for it. Um, so this way we used her wedding band and soldered the earrings on to make a really unique and beautiful bypass ring for her. Um, I think it cost her like $150 to do this. <laughs> and to buy that in a retail store, it would be about $1,250. Uh, $1,400 to buy that new. So you save a ton of money. The middle one is also a wedding band and the larger diamond was a pendant she had and the smaller stones uh, were from her engagement ring that, um, like I said, you wouldn't get any money for anyway. And she got this beautiful bypass ring. And the one with the emeralds, that's also her wedding band. A different person, her wedding band. And the small emeralds, those wouldn't get any money. Those, again, would be deducted. Uh, they are included, so definitely wouldn't get more money from it. And she wanted some sort of funky ring, something to go with her new style now, something that she can wear and have fun with. And when she got this ring, she was so excited. She couldn't stop looking at her hands. And, um, you know, she kept taking pictures of it and posting it and everything. And it's a very cathartic, exciting feeling uh, when you trans when you empower yourself to transform this uh ring that used to symbolize, you know, an ended relationship into something that's new and brings you into that new chapter in your life. So um, this is a client I'm working with now who inherited some pieces and she inherited this ring that's a 1950s style ring and she's more of a modern woman and she likes, you know, a little bit different unique pieces so we transformed this ring into a negative space ring and um, scattered the diamonds all around. And that's the kind of style she likes. So now she can wear this inherited piece, like I told you about my grandmother, and um, have the memory of her mother with her, but in a style that she would wear. So by repurposing, you really save time because you're getting exactly what you want. You don't have to go from store to store. You don't have to search the internet. You just get exactly what you want. You save money because you're using your gemstones. You don't have to buy new gemstones for that. Um, you're getting a new custom a piece of jewelry, so one of a kind only for you, and you're part of the process every step of the way. Plus you get money back. So that money that you are gonna get for selling your metal, you get towards your new piece of repurposed uh, jewelry. It gets deducted from the cost of that. 
So that's the end. And I want to thank you all. And as a special offer, um, I want to gift you guys a free rejuvenated discovery session. And uh, this way, if you have jewelry that you would love to transform into something new and exciting, giving it a fresh new life, um, you can discover the possibilities of transforming it plus get 20% off of your repurposing project. Uh, and every rejuvenated uh, design project, you get a complimentary uh, expert appraisal so you can know the value of your new piece and also be protected. So if you email me by Monday, um, you get the special offer. So it's jennifer at rejuvenateddesigns.com. And you can check out my website, rejuvenateddesigns.com, and see the different transformations and uh, book your rejuvenated discovery session. So I am, I'll cut the slides. I am open to any questions that you guys have for me about selling jewelry, or if you have other jewelry questions, um, I am open to answer anything that you may be questioning. <laughs> I have a question. Sure. If you, how do you know if you can leave your ring with somebody to get a fair estimate and come back? I've heard a lot of cases where you left the ring, you weren't there to observe it, they'll switch. You mean in a jewelry store? Yeah. Well, now, nowadays that's not really that uh, much of a problem just because there's social media. And um, so if somebody does that to you, then your name is plastered all over social media, Yelp or whatever, and you're going to be out of business, <laughs> basically. But you should also go to a jeweler that you trust. If you're going to a jeweler and you don't trust them, um, you probably wouldn't trust that they would do a good job for you either. So, <laughs> you know, I wouldn't, I would go to a jeweler that you trust for sure. And um, somebody that's been in business and reputable, uh, somebody who's an expert in the field, um, not somebody who like opened a shop yesterday and, <laughs> you know, <laughs> just gonna sell you something. So yeah, definitely somebody reputable, uh, definitely somebody you trust, or maybe somebody recommended them to you. Um, that would be the way to go. But like I said, with social media, what, you know, a few bad posts, this person switched my diamonds, whatever, they're going to be closed and shut down. Would it pay to have a piece certified or prior so that you know that the map, so that you know to get your stone back? Before you leave it to a jewel, if it's, yeah, if, it's a, it if it's an important piece, if it's, something that's like four, five, six carats. Um, sometimes a jewelry store will send it to be certified first or to uh, bring to wholesale dealers to see what um, will be offered before they will give you a price on things that are, you know, bigger than, than normal. So for, for you to certify it, you don't have to necessarily certify it. Um, a jewelry store or something can send it to be certified. If you want to, you can. If it's, like I said, if it's an important piece, like over four carats, you know, you should, you should definitely think about maybe certifying it if you're going to sell it. Or um, if you sell it to the jeweler, ask them if they can send it for you they may get a better deal than, um, I'm not sure how the pricing goes if you're an independent person versus a, uh, versus a jewelry store. Can we, can we wait a minute? We're talking. Great. Talk. I have a question, Jennifer. Yeah. Could you talk about insuring jewelry? Um, what's the insurance value as opposed to what, a, what I would get in the jewelry store, the retail value? Yeah. And it's worth it. Because I find I have a jewelry policy and I probably have paid five times over, you know, what point do you say, this is crazy? Um, do, you, do you insure it with your home or do you insure it with the jewelry insurance? I have a separate policy with my homeowner's insurance. 
Um, there is an insurance company called Jewelers Mutual, and they are strictly for jewelry and uh, watches. And they, um, they're very competitive with pricing. What the difference between a retail price and insurance price is <clears throat> if you were to lose that piece, it's to re either remake it if it's something that is um, kind of unique. Mm -hmm. So like nowadays, CAD, CAD fees would go into that, jeweler fees would go into that, you know, metal prices would go into that, gem uh, stone prices would go into that, um, you know, polishing and finishing would go into that. Uh, if it's just a piece that you can get at a retail store, the insurance, uh, price should be what you bought it at retail. Sometimes there's 20% uh, added to the insurance, um, to the insurance appraisal just because it covers you for two to two to three years because they say to update it every two to three years in case of inflation and things like that because gold and platinum definitely is much different than it was, you know, a few years ago. So it probably went up, you know, maybe a couple of hundred dollars. So it's just to, um, to cover you in case you lost that piece. Um, but if it's, like I said, if it's a special piece, the insurance value would probably be a little bit more because they would have to remake it custom. And that usually costs a little bit more to do. Um, with Jewelers Mutual, they will cover you internationally. I don't work for them or anything, but <laughs> um, these are the policies that we usually recommend in jewelry stores. And also if you need any kind of big repairs, like if you need a new head for your diamond, if you lose your diamonds, uh, if you lose like, you know, say you have baguettes on the side, if you lose those diamonds, it will cover you for that kind of thing. So something like, and um, it also covers watches. So if you need to, uh, do an overhaul, you know, if you have an expensive watch and you need to do some sort of overhaul or fixing with that, it covers you with that as well. Um, I'm not sure what the homeowners does if it's just loss and theft, but with a special policy like Jewelers Mutual, they do uh, big repairs too, or smaller repairs if you lose any kind of diamond or um, any kind of gemstone, they'll cover you with that. So it's just to cover you in case of, uh, you know, loss and if you need to remake it or you want to get that um, piece of jewelry back. And also they'll, I guess they'll give you money for that piece too, the value of that piece. Okay. What if it was an inherited piece and you haven't got a bill of sale for it? You know, like I had a problem with my grandmother. She had a nice piece, but we didn't have a bill of sale. She and, an appraisal. And you got an appraisal. It was, it was stolen. And we wanted to get so for the insurance company gave us a hard time. We showed photos and so forth. So should, if we inherit a piece, we should get them appraised. Yeah, you can yes. get them yeah. Cool. Um if it's stolen, well, if it wasn't insured, um, uh, if it wasn't insured, you can't really claim it. You can't really claim it. Well, um, well it's part of our policy. You know, if it was part part of your policy. You can get uh, what's called a hypothetical appraisal, meaning that you had this piece, it was probably worth this much because it probably had this kind of gold. And so it's more of a hypothetical appraisal because you don't have the piece there. Okay, I have a uh, question. Yeah. All right, since you do this repurposing of jewelry, okay, mm -hmm. and you also, uh, copy something like, uh, say, a uh, earring. Somebody lost mm -hmm. one earring and they really like the piece and they really, you know, like we, we have a piece, my wife has a piece of jewelry mm -hmm. that every time we go anywhere, we go to the store just to see if maybe we could find the piece again. And you always lose the, your favorite one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, we can uh, duplicate um, a ring. I mean, I'm sorry, an earring. Um, if it's something that's solid, we can, uh, def 
you can send it to be cast. And what they do is they make a mold out of that old one. If it's not, uh, then we can uh, make a CAD or computer aided drawing of the piece that you do have to duplicate that. So yes, it can be done. Okay. And how expensive is that? I don't know. What <laughs> Depends if your son's an Eagle Scout or not. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's your firstborn. <laughs> well, I mean, it depends on the piece. It depends, I mean, it depends on the piece, but I mean, uh -huh. you know. Uh, okay. The next question I have, okay, since you do regular jewelry as well, also, do you also do, and not necessarily for me, but I mean for any other people, I mean, uh, do you work with estate jewelry as well also? You mean appraising it? No. We oh. work Oh, yeah. Repurposing. Yeah, repurposing. Yep. Okay. Just, yeah. You know, because, you know, you're talking about, you know, gold and, you know, diamonds and sapphires, but I mean, sometimes people have other stuff as well also that, you know, may not be, you know, gold, okay, but they like the piece and they need to repair or they want to re redo something with it, you know. Oh, you mean uh, costume jewelry? Yeah, that's uh, estate jewelry, isn't it? Is that what no. that's? Estate jewelry is something that you inherit. Um, right. It can be costume, but um, it's not necessarily costume. Um, well, I usually repurpose the, uh, the the stones and put it into something that's that's new. Like, say you have a um, or I have this pin here. So, say you inherited a pin like this. You know, you can make and this is a brooch and it's beautiful. Uh, I think it was my great grandmother's. Whose pin was this? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, a lot of women don't wear brooches anymore. It's out of fashion. But you can take all these diamonds and maybe make cluster earrings out of it. Or you can make some sort of pendant out of it. You can make a ring out of it. Um, what, whatever you desire. If it's a costume piece that has you know, synthetic stones or um, stones that aren't necessarily um, real, you can still remount them. Is it worth it? If it's worth it to you and it has those memories um, that you want to bring into that new piece, then it's worth it. Um, usually when I repurpose, then you get that scrap metal to, uh, deducted from the, the cost of remaking. Uh, so that's the uh, incentive uh, for that. With costume jewelry, if it's just a base metal, it's not really um, worth anything. Does that answer your question? I just forget that, just mention that. You know, okay. I didn't <laughs> because I have, I have had pieces, uh, I've had, I have had clients who had their grandmother's ring and, um, oh, bye, Audrey. <laughs> um, their grandmother's ring that did have synthetics in it, but it was very, very meaningful to her. And uh, we, I made a necklace and a ring from it. And, you know, she loves that she can wear these new pieces with her grandmother's sewn synthetic, even though they were synthetic uh, stones it still reminded her of her grandmother and, and uh, of those special times that they had together. And, um, you know, that's the great thing about repurposing is keeping those memories and those stories alive. And the last question I have for you is, where do you work out of? Uh, I work out of my home in Westbury, um, but I also offer a concierge service where I can come to you or we can meet somewhere that's comfortable for you. Um, you know, it depends what it is. If it's an appraisal, then you need to come here because I have my microscope and things like that. If it's uh, something with repurposing, I can come to you um, or, like I said, meet you somewhere that's comfortable sure. for you. One last question. Do you, yep. Does it pay typically to, to remove the stone when you're appraising it or anything like that? Is it better to do that or not? Um, not necessarily. I can get pretty close to the estimated weight of it. For an appraisal, um, you know, you, you do do that range, but of estimated weight, color, and clarity, but you find something that's comparable to that weight, color, and clarity. And um, usually when it's an appraisal versus when you sell it, 
you go towards the higher end. When you sell it, you go towards the lower end. <laughs> so when you appraise, you go towards the higher end. This way, you're completely covered. <laughs> sure. So you, you have that, that opposite, um, <laughs> opposite world. That's Jennifer, what, what's the, your recommendation for cleaning and maintaining these pieces? Um, so to clean them at home, I would take a toothbrush, not your husband's, um, so an old toothbrush, and um, so something with soft bristles, and dishwashing soap, so like, um, I don't know, what are some dishwashing soap? Palm olive or something like that, you know, that cuts the grease and the dirt. So it's gonna cut the grease and the dirt from your, your stones. Um, and just brush it, um, usually, you want to brush like underneath the stone and all around the sides plus the top of, of the stones and get it nice and sudsy and try and get all of the um, dirt off of it and then just rinse it under some lukewarm uh, water and if you have a lint-free cloth you can just pat it dry uh, with a lint-free cloth. Um, I guess you can do a paper towel but that may uh, leave a lint. Just when you put it back on don't like put your finger like right back on it, you know, because <laughs> any kind of grease or dirt on your fingers, not that your hands are dirty, but they, uh, they do have oils. So once you put your finger on the diamond or on colored stones, it changes the way that the light reacts to it. So that's why it may look dull um, if you have uh, any kind of oils or soap or um, any kind of lotions on it, uh, any kind of grease will change that optical effect. So if you clean it with just that soft toothbrush and some palm olive <laughs> and uh, rinse it off of uh, warm water, um, then you should be good to go. If it's very dirty, then you can put it in a small little saucepan with some water. Um, get the water, not boiling, but pretty hot and put some of the soap into the water. Uh, you can hang it off of the edge with like a um, paper clip or something like that. And let it just like, you know, soak in there for uh, maybe two, three minutes. Um, it depends, don't do this with pearls or opals or anything that's porous. So something like your sapphires or diamonds, things like that. And then you can brush it afterwards and rinse it again. And so that's if it's like really like got some brown dirt in it, then you can put it in that sauce, sauce pan and uh, let it sit for a little while. Would you recommend cleaning it with uh, alcohol? No. No. <laughs> No, I, I saw it, it was done in a jewelry store, in Bloomingdale's actually. They dipped diamond necklace in alcohol. In alcohol? Well, with diamonds you can, but if it's like colored stones or like I said, something porous, alcohol I don't really... Uh, like rubbing for, alcohol. Yeah. I guess, I mean, for diamonds you can. For diamonds you can, because... Um, not that diamonds are indestructible, but alcohol won't hurt it. And usually it's something that won't leave like lint or residue. So you can do your diamonds with alcohol, but, um, you know, you want to get that toothbrush to kind of get that dirt from, un from underneath mostly, because a lot of dirt gets trapped underneath. So, you and that's where the light return comes out of so it goes in and you want it to come back out so if the bottom is clean you get that nice light return and you get that uh, nice sparkle back to you can you help um can you make a chain not not a necklace or not a ring but a chain a thin chain out of say gold um i don't manufacture chain no. i can get a chain <laughs> mm -hmm. but i um i don't have the tools to manufacture a chain because usually chains are uh manufactured at, mm -hmm. uh, by um by like robot you know by machines mm -hmm. um if it's you know, handmade link i guess you can do handmade link it's uh, very labor intensive to do mm -hmm. a handmade link 
um, you have something in mind? I can. Yes, so there are uh, golden rings that are just lying there, and no one is wearing them. Um, they're from uh, the former Soviet Union. Oh. Pink, gold. Mm -hmm. uh, but no one's wearing those rings. Um, oh, so you mean to just like kind of link them together and solder them? No, no, to oh. to melt them and actually make a thin chain, you know, for necklace. from it. Yeah, oh. I I didn't know whether it was possible to do that. Um, we we don't particularly melt down the gold and reuse the gold only because. Um, when you do that, you can, can sometimes, since there's impurities, have porosity, which are like little holes, like mm -hmm. kind of Swiss cheese. So it kind of mm -hmm. um, destroys the um, durability of mm -hmm. the gold. Um, not all the time, but sometimes depending on the impurities that might be in the piece, it could happen. So um, we, we usually, t if we use the gold piece, we take it to use it as like a base for something or within the design. We don't melt it down and, and recreate. I see. So um, okay. I'm not really sure who might do that. But, but you can take those, those uh, diamond pieces that she has, those pink diamonds, and you can put it on a necklace or a- No, no, they were, they were gold. Oh, pink gold, okay. Yeah. No, she wants to melt them down and make a necklace uh, with the gold uh, from the rings. You mentioned uh, pearls before. How do you care for pearls? Pearl, pearls you want to, um, you don't want to put it in a hot, dry place because then they can uh, get little cracks, kind of like how opal, you want to keep it um, somewhere not necessarily moist, but not, not like a dry area. And to clean them just with a wet cloth, a damp wet cloth. And um, never put any kind of perfumes or hairspray, any kind of alcohol or um, things with like acids on it or near it because <laughs> then the nacre will come off. So if you're getting ready for something, you put I wouldn't put the perfume where you're wearing it. I would put it somewhere else, like on your wrist or something. Um, and then, and then you can put the necklace on or whatever pearls you're you're putting on, whatever pearls dad you're putting on. <laughs> um, but I wouldn't put it into contact with any kind of. Um, uh, I, always, I always heard that if you wear the. The body heat gives the, the pearl a, uh, an additional glow. Is, is that you true? mean your sweat? Not my sweat. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> <sweat. laughs> no, I was always told the body heat like makes the uh, pearl become more lush, uh, uh, lustrous. Maybe, maybe because you turn red and the pearls are white. And so it can. <laughs> Take care, Elena. <laughs> I know she had to run. I, I never heard that, but you can go with that, sure. <laughs> if my father told me. <laughs> well, if your father told you, then it was true. <laughs> but, so, how, how'd you guys like this? Was it very enlightening for you? It was very, it was very interesting. Okay. Very good. Very interesting. Yes. So like I said, this is the first of my 2021 webinars. Um, hopefully uh, I'll be, I'm I wanna be doing one a month or something like that. That's my goal for 2021. And um, thank you, Martha. <laughs> and uh, so hopefully you can join in my future ones and um, we can have more fun. I do, Debbie, I do want to do a Zoom party of uh, jewelry cleaning so everyone can have that clean jewelry since, um, you know, you're supposed to be washing your hands now and be healthy and clean. This goes for your jewelry. I, I can't tell you how many times I've 
people come in with their jewelry that is so <laughs> yeah, so disgustingly grotty and everything. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that would be good. I have quite a few pieces like that. <laughs> and after I do an appraisal, I like wash my hands like, like thoroughly to to get it off of me. <laughs> so I will be doing a jewelry cleaning Zoom party. So right. be an expert at it. Okay, I'm in for that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I have to go. Thank you very yeah. much, Jennifer. It's been great. It's been great. Right. Okay, everybody, if you don't have any Thank more you. questions, all right. Best. Bye. Bye. You're gonna have a good night. Thank you all for joining. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Take care. Bye.